We are thankful, Father, that as men, we take the discipline to wake up early in the morning, to come to meet together, to seek the face of God. Uh, I don't want to come to this study personally unless we are, we are brothers that want to seek the face of God. And I pray for each brother here today that we are pursuing God with all our heart, mind, and soul. We may have roadblocks. We may find ourselves at times slipping and falling, but you take us by the right hand and you catch us and you pull us back up to walk with you. May we be concerned with every brother in this room that we are walking with Christ and that we would want to pursue you. We're, we are just seconds away. We are just one breath away from eternity. And you know when that is. So let us be men who want to live for eternity. <clears throat> that we want to walk in this world to reflect another world which is to come. And that takes fellowship with you. It takes time in the Word. It takes discipline by the, the Spirit to walk with you, God. And that's what we desire. We may have our difficulties. We have our sins, our temptations, oh God. But we want to walk with you. And so come, Lord, and bolster us this day that we as men would walk as men of God in a world that's not a friend of grace. And I pray this morning as we would go through a very difficult passage that you might give us light and understanding that has been the darkness and such uh, for so many who have caused them to stumble over the centuries in this passage. So God, come. And guide and direct. I'm trusting in you this day. Amen. We pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. We're in James chapter 2, and we started in verse 14 through 20, and we finished that up last week. And so we want to begin the passage uh, in 21 through 26, but I want to read. The entire section again of chapter 2, verse 14, through the rest of the chapter. <clears throat> James chapter 2, verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize you foolish fella? that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working, I'll translate this a little different, by means of his works and has the result of the works faith was brought to the goal, was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. <coughs> you see that a man is justified by works 
and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? <clears throat> For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now, you ought to have a hundred questions, right? Today, in the study of God's Word, it's going to become absolutely essential that we understand the context. If you take these verses and just read these verses to people, you will find that you will uh, have a misunderstanding of what Paul, excuse me, James, is trying to say. And they will say well, there must be some kind of contradiction in the scripture. Matter of fact, you will find many people, Roman Catholics specifically, who will turn you to this specific passage to demonstrate that it is not the Reformation by faith alone that a person is saved. And you can see why they will turn to this passage. But I hope as we would go through this in the next few weeks that you would be able to take the context and to sort it out to be able to explain to a person who wants to hear <laughs> that what really James is arguing, okay? All right, everybody has the conflict within their mind, right? How in the world could he say that you're not justified by faith alone? Well, and that's what, what Paul says. We're going to look at that specifically. Well, the background of this passage is it's important to keep the purpose of James center focus in this section, which begins in chapter 2, verse 14, when he says, <clears throat> uh, if a man says he has faith, he didn't say that a man has faith. He says he has faith. The question is, is his statement true? Okay. Just because you say something, something ought to, to indicate by your actions that what you say is what you really have. So it's important to see that James is is centering in on somebody's faith, what kind of faith it is. And I'll give you my conclusion, which some people say it doesn't help until you have the explanation. And it's the typical uh, Reformation statement that we usually only receive the first half of it. The justification is by faith alone, but not a faith that stands alone. Okay? Paul will talk about the statement that justification is by faith alone. James is talking about a faith that does not stand alone. What, it's not the issue whether faith alone saves, it's what kind of faith you have. Is it a living faith? So Paul and James are looking at two different aspects of the same doctrine. And that makes the difference. Now I have to prove that, don't I? Let's look at it then. James chapter 2, 14 through 20, James dwells on a negative aspect of, of faith because he's always asking the question, can that faith save you? And he wants you to say, no. <laughs> now, how do you know? Remember, uh, in Greek, there is a two ways by which an author can put a negative article. And it determines what way the... Uh, author wants you to say yes or no. And in the 14 through 20, can that faith save you? 
he puts a may in there, which means no. I want you to say to the answer to that question, no. Okay. So he, that's what he looks at. So in chapter 2, verse 17, even so, if he has no works, is, uh, uh, works, is dead being by itself. Conclusion. Verse 20, but are you willing to, to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Okay. So notice the negative. No, I mean, yeah, this is not good. So, in 21 through 26, <laughs> well, he dwells more on the positive argument. He's trying to say that kind of faith in 14 through 20 cannot say. But then he goes back now to the positive side of what he's trying to argue in verses 21 through 26. So the essence of the argument is that true saving faith is demonstrated by good works. You may not see it, but who has to see it? God. You may say, well, I don't see his faith. Well, are you the final arbitrator of his faith? No. God is. So we may not know. We should know, right? Every Christian should be doing that. So James dwells on the, uh, uh, the, th the, the thought that true saving faith is demonstrated by good works. It's not obtained by good works. Please don't get that. It's not faith plus good works, I will send you to hell. It's a faith that works. The faith that, that issues forth into action because it's a living faith. Everybody okay? He uses two examples in scripture to bring forth this truth. Paul is just trying to say that justification is by faith alone. James says, yeah, 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 yeah. But it has to be a living faith. And that's what James is talking about. It's a little bit different issue than Paul. Now, Paul addresses that issue also, but James does it quite uh, in, in, in a concentrated way here in, ja in chapter 2. Right. So he uses two examples in Scripture to bring this forth. Abraham the patriarch and, a and Rahab the prostitute. And he has a reason why he does that. Okay. Now, with that introduction, <laughs> let's try to turn to the text itself. The question uh, that is raised in verse 21 is, <clears throat> was not Abraham our father justified by works. And you kind of say, James, why, why, are you, why are you messing with me? I'm more Pauline in my thinking. Well, then he adds to it by saying, we notice that the negative particle used by James indicated, indicates he wants you to say, yes. <laughs> you say, well, you're digging yourself in a hole, aren't you, prof? He said, no, no. Remember, James has a different issue that he wants to talk about than usually what we think about Paul. We'll look at it in just a second. Does this not contradict the teaching of the Apostle Paul? Well, let's hold our place here, make sure we got our correct understandings, and let's turn to Romans chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. If you are turning, if you're turning to the subject of justification, this is one of the, as uh, I can hear my professor say, the sedes doctrina, the, the one of the great uh, examples that you would turn to to demonstrate uh, the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Verse three, Romans four. For what does the Scripture say? 
And Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him uh, as a favor or we could use the word grace. But, uh, um, excuse me, reckoned to him as righteousness or reckoned to him unto righteousness. And that quotation is from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Now that becomes important down the line here. Okay. We could argue, as I argue when I uh, uh, did my exposition of Genesis, that in Genesis 15, 6, it's looking back to Genesis 12. But that's not a debate that has to be made here in James chapter 2. But... Abraham believed God and it was reckoned. It's not a Texas reckon, okay? That's a biblical reckon. Texas is not reckon so or reckon not. It's credited, imputed, set down to your account, deposited in the bank. How's that? Kind of credited, okay? So it was credited. So Abraham believed what God said and he was justified. Yes. So what Abraham did is it larger than what Rahab did in regard to reckoning? Um, Does that have anything uh, to do with it? No. I would say that in my thinking, whether it is true or not, I would say that, a, that Rahab's justification of belief was... Uh, more marvelous than Abraham because God appeared to Abraham showed him all kinds of stuff you know in Genesis 15 he ratifies the Abrahamic covenant to him and the promises of all that he was given him but Rahab had about that much well Abraham had that much revelation I would think Rahab was about like that, but what she knew, she believed. It was justified. She was a Gentile. And we can start seeing the concept, and we'll look at that. Okay. So, it's important for us because it's become, James is going to use Genesis 15, 6, but in a different way but, uh, than Paul. It, not in a different way, but how he uses it is different. Paul is using it to demonstrate that Abraham believed God and he was reckoned or credited to his account. This is exactly the way we do. Now I am, I am giving you a definition of the word justify in a specific sense. And this is where you get in trouble. And I will get to that in a little bit. Paul is using the word justify here is to set down to your account. To impute to you. To, to give you a status. As, as, as I say often in, in my studies uh, of the book of Romans when I teach it at school. And when we get into the concept of justification. That... Um, it is the law court that you have to look at. And standing before God as the judge. And he looks upon you. And if he looked upon you and your inherent righteousness and unrighteousness. You would be guilty every time. And you would be thrown in the lake of fire. <clears throat> and then I say to them. No one gets to heaven unless you're just as righteous as Jesus Christ is righteous. And when you put it that way, even the pagans, they'll go, well, then nobody's going to be there. And I go, precisely, unless, unless God gives you the status of the righteousness of Christ. And that is exactly what happens when you believe in Jesus. That he gives you the status position of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You say, but I don't deserve that. That's grace. And that's mercy. 
Matter of fact, this is the very essence of the gospel for which, I'm sure not you, but the essence of the gospel that very, I have to explain, and I get these starry eye looked at from my students, that they, this is like the first time they've ever heard it. And yet it's the very essence of the gospel. Okay? That the reason I get to heaven is that I've been imputed. I've been set down to my account. I have been credited with the, the status of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because if he judges me on the inherent righteousness of myself, I'd be thrown into the lake of fire. Isn't that great? We're imputed. We are set down to his account. Yeah, he gave evidence of his faith by what he said. That is it. That's all the time he had. Well, that's yeah, it is. I mean, if you testified to the to the great the grace of God to somebody, isn't that a work? Isn't that a demonstration of your faith? Yeah, it is. So the only demonstration that we have on the thief on the cross is his statement. Because why? Earlier, That's all he had. That's all the time he had. Earlier he states that the demons. That Jesus is God. Yeah. yeah. And they shudder. But they're not saved. But in essence, that's kind of what the thief was doing. I mean, you know, this thing. Oh, no. basically just stating the obvious. Yeah, there's a difference. Yeah, see, this is where the difficulty of statements is. Um, let's just, uh, I always say a, a, an illustration from history, you know. I believe in Abraham Lincoln. I believe that he ex existed. I believe that he uh, did certain things in history. <clears throat> but but I, my belief in Abraham Lincoln has nothing to do with my eternal salvation. And some people believe, I believe in Jesus, Jesus Christ. And they, just like they believe in Abraham Lincoln, that he existed. That he, that he had it, but they're not trusting him anything for eternal life. And that's the difference between one statement and another statement. What are you trusting for? What, are you, what kind of statement? This statement is talking about some historical fact, some kind of fact that he existed. The other one says, I put my eternal destiny on Christ. That when I take the leap of death, I won't slip through the fingers of God and, and into hell because he'll catch me. And I'm depending on him alone to get there. And the thief on the cross, then somehow in that moment, God was able to extract a chain of faith. That's correct. By his statement. We, we may have missed it. We may say, well, I don't know whether he did or not, but it's obvious because he said, today you'll be in paradise. He saw his faith. Yeah. I think we may be not going to say a lot of times the statement is not complete. Maybe the statement is mentally as you are God and you can save me. I believe you can save me mentally. If he says you are God, you choose to be God. Maybe the statement is not, we don't go to the time of saying what we completely believe that we would. But God knows your heart. God knows your heart. Yeah, so we can only know what a person says. He knows the heart for which it was said. And so today uh, you will be in paradise because you remember me when you go into your paradise. I mean, you kind of go, is that faith? It, it could be. Depends on the heart. And guess who sees the heart? God does. I mean, I mean, uh, Augustine was saved by uh, there was many things that led up to it but he was in a courtyard and there were some children playing on the on the playground saying take up and read take up and read take up and read it was some kind of i don't know what they were saying they would just take up and read take up and read so he he said okay 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 i mean they weren't even speaking to him they were just playing saying that statement take up and read take up and read so he went over and there was a bible there and he and he picked it up and he read and the first verse he read you kind of go I've forgotten where it was, like it's in Romans somewhere that has nothing to do with justification. And he believed. 
amazing. I go, how'd you get faith out of that verb? I mean, didn't tell anything about Jesus. Well, there was a lot of stuff that went for that, right? You had a praying mother. You grew up on that. There's all kinds of things that were playing there. God just I said, well, it's time to go. I'll bring you to faith. And he came. So here in uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 3, he's talking about Abraham. And he was reckoned or credited as righteousness in Genesis 15, 6. Okay? Remember the, the historically where this happens. Okay? Because James in chapter uh, 21, when he goes to say that Abraham was justified by his works, does he go to Genesis 15, 6 as the illustration of, of verse 21? No. He goes to Genesis 22, which is 30 years later. Are you with me? So verse 21 of James is referring, as we're going to look at in just a minute, if I ever get to it, to, to, to Genesis uh, uh, 22, not to Genesis 15. Because if he, if he goes to Genesis 15, we got a contradiction. We have a contradiction that Paul goes to Genesis 15 and says it's by faith alone. And James would be saying, which he didn't, this Genesis 15, 16, well, by works. No. He goes to Genesis 22, 30 years later. Why? He's just demonstrating that Abraham's life is demonstrating something of justification. That's not when he was justified. So, let's stay with Paul right now. Okay, verse 4 of chapter 4. Now to the one who works, his wage is reckoned, credited, set down to your account, not as grace, favor, but what is due. I mean, if you work 40 hours, you don't come squealing into or, or weaseling into the office of your boss and sheepishly saying, please give me your check. You come in and say, boss, where's my check? Why? You earned it. It's not something gracious that he does to give you a check. You earned it. Okay, that's what he's saying here. Now to the one who works, his wage is, uh, is, is not reckoned as a, a favor, but what is due. If whatever part of salvation you think you are uh, trying to earn is what part you could storm heaven and say give it to me. But Paul is saying you can't do that. Verse 5. But the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned, credited, imputed unto righteousness. And you say, to, that's exactly the opposite of what James says. No. James is looking at something different of the same subject. Okay. Paul is taking the first part of the statement. Justification is by faith alone. James is taking the second half. A faith that does not stand alone. They are not contradicting each other. They are complementing each other. Right? But if you just took and read this text and then turned to James that we just read, you go, Scripture is contradicting each other. If you don't look at the context of how Paul is arguing and how James is arguing. All right. Yes. Just to jot down a note here. Paul says that we're saved by faith alone. James says our faith can't help but manifest itself in our life, our deeds. Okay. He's saying that like our faith m should be, must be it to God, should be evident in our works. Okay. In other words, <clears throat> Paul is saying by faith alone justifies. James says yes. Yeah. But what kind of faith? One you just say? Or one that really demonstrates that it's a living faith? 
They're two different issues of the same. It's going to manifest itself in mind. If you have truly, if you have true faith, it's going to manifest. I might not see it, but God will see it. Now, if you live with somebody like my wife, she better see it. Because she's living with it. You see what I'm saying? So the, the more contact you have somebody, the more likely you will know whether that person has it. Now, we're not fruit inspectors. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 13, with this carnal church of Corinth, because they were acting like unbelievers and saying that they were believers, he says you examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. He didn't say, I'm going to. He says, you do that. Or we'd have fruit inspector committees in churches, right? Oh. Well, yeah, we do. That's official. That's official. Yeah. We were kicking this around in Sunday school. And one person mentioned, if you're in love with the Holy Spirit, you can't help yourself. Right. It is going to manifest itself in your life. It's not something you want to try to Say, well, i got to make sure I do it. Right. Yeah. Then it's going to come out, and you can't hold it back. That's exact, very good. I'm glad you added that, bro, because that's exactly right. It's not something we crank out. The Holy Spirit is going to motivate you, convict you to continue. So that's why it's so, it's so, uh, uh, James is so sure of what he's saying. Because it doesn't depend on you ultimately. It depends on the Holy Spirit that motivates you to do that. Yeah, it's uh, Ephesians 2.10 is what we looked at. We're going to look at it at good. Good passage. Uh, we're going to look at it, Ralph. For, yeah. So, is man justified by works or faith or both? I hope you already see, know my answer to that. Uh, the answer to the question in the context of the theology of James we must understand the usage of three words in James chapter 2. <coughs> so what am I doing? I'm now defining words according to how James uses it in his book. I, I took you to Romans and explained that. Let's turn back now to James. If you're going to explain this passage, you have to, to uh, at least understand these three words in the in the context of James chapter 2 the first word that you, you need to deal with is works now I'm going to contrast this with Paul all right because that's what most people try to do well well Paul says this okay well Paul saying this what does James say why James Paul didn't write James James wrote James so we need to know James' understanding of his own words, not Paul. But I'll make the contrast because that's what people do. Paul uses the term work most of the time as the legalistic efforts of an unbeliever to work merit before God so that he may try to save, be saved by them. That's usually the context when Paul uses the word work. All right. This explains why Paul says that the works of the law or the works of the flesh, no man is able to be justified before God. And guess what? James would agree. Yeah, we're going to get another one like this too. <laughs> James uses the, the term work in the context of of a believer who is energized by faith to produce works. And I should have added from Herb's comment, motivated to do works by the Holy Spirit. I'll change that. Okay. Paul would agree with James. What did I just do? Paul and James are not at odds. They're looking at it in different ways. So, work. Paul, usually toward the concept of an unbeliever who is trying to be justified by his works. James, in this passage, 
deals with a believer who's demonstrating his faith or the lack thereof, therefore not being a man of faith. Okay? The second, oh, Galatians 5, 6, we uh, saw uh, in the text, let me read that real quick. Uh, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision anything, mean anything but faith working through love. The outward expression of your faith demonstrating itself through love. Or as uh, Ralph was uh, looking at, a uh, great text in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace are you saved through faith, and it's not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, lest any man should boast. For, explain further, this is it, we are his God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Then he adds, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. So we are predestined to walk in good works. Why? It demonstrates our faith. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. How's that? Yes. Wasn't circumcision part of this demonstration at the time? Of faith? Yeah. Could be or could not. Same way with today's baptism. A person could just be baptized and thinking that's, you know, that's, that's saving me. Or he can say, no, that's not saving me. I'm just demonstrating that I'm saved. Same thing. Any work. It, 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 the question is, is it just a demonstration of my faith or am I trying to say that that is the <coughs> means of saving me? Big difference, isn't it? All right, conclusion. Beware of the different usages of the word, word or term work. Paul says a person is not justified by works. He's using the term work in the context of unbelievers who are trying to get to heaven. When James uses the word work in James 2.21 and following, he is using it in the context of believers giving evidence that their faith is living or if they don't demonstrate, demonstrate that they're not living faith, therefore not a belief. Okay. The second word that needs to be defined is not just only the word work, but the word faith. All right. When Paul uses the word faith, he means a true living operative faith. It is a faith which motivates the believer to obey the scriptures by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Where James in verses 21 through 26 is dealing with a dead, inoperative, professing faith. James is dealing with a person who has an intellectual or a creedal faith. He says, remember chapter 2 verse 14, says he has faith but does not manifest it in his daily life. This type of faith cannot save. So there is a so-called so faith that doesn't save. Can I, is, is, it, is it okay for me if I meet someone and I'm not exactly sure if they're a believer or not, and, and I just see them occasionally, can I use the, 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 the fruits that I see or not see in their life in, in guiding me how I address them, more as, you know, talking about salvation? Yes. Can I ask that? Yes, okay that, is, that, is, that is valid. Okay. Yes, because you're not saying either way, but you're trying to discern how you approach them. Okay. Whether I should approach them as a believer uh -huh. or should I approach them as an unbeliever, and then you may switch it as you learn more information. Okay. Yes, okay. it's valid. Okay. I agree. Yeah, you, it, it, you could have been fooled, but he, 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 he followed it up, and it, it made sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
All right? Um, the final word that needs to be defined, and this is absolutely crucial, is not only works and not only faith, but the word justify. Okay? And this is where we as Protestants get in trouble. Okay? If somebody is, if, if begins to say, well, what is justification? We usually define it as a Pauline term. And that's usually the way it's used in Scripture. But if you take the Pauline justification meaning and apply it to James, you're in trouble. Most often, and especially in Paul, the word justified is a forensic term that brings us into the law court of heaven. A forensic, forensic evident means a declaration, right? You declare something in the court. Why would a court uh, entertain a decorative statement by an individual? It's because he's a specialist. And he's giving forensic evidence by his experience of who he is making a statement. Well, we are declared righteous by God. Though, guess what? When he declares us righteous, we're not inherently righteous. We're unrighteous. He justifies, as Paul said in verse 5 of chapter 4, the ungodly. <laughs> That's why the Roman Catholics had problems with that. How can you justify the ungodly? That'd be an unjust judge. It's because somebody's paid for your debt as a substitute. All right, it's a forensic term. Um, as we said before, if I walked into heaven with the inherent righteousness that I have, it'd be like I had these clothes on for 64 years. You could smell me before you saw me. And it would stink in the nostrils of God and I would be sent and declared not, I mean guilty, and thrown in the lake of fire. But what happens is, because I've placed my trust in Jesus Christ, Jesus comes into the law court and takes my filthy robes and puts it on him and he goes pays for it at Calvary. So he takes my debt so that I may be forgiven. In a sense, in this illustration, he comes back into the law court and he gives me his robe, which is representative of his righteousness. And so I put on his robe and the judge looks at me, sees the robe of Christ's righteousness and he declares me not guilty, you're justified before me. And so therefore God justifies the ungodly. He pays for the sin and therefore he imputes to me his righteousness. And I can stand before him as correct. That's the Pauline term justification. Forgiveness of sins and declared righteous before God. Based on Christ's righteousness, not mine. When we place our trust in Christ, our sins are forgiven and we are imputed, set down to our account, the status of Christ's righteousness, okay? We don't actually get it because then we'd be just as God as God with God, but we get the status of it, the position of it. Thus God, the judge, declares us righteous based upon Christ's righteousness and not our own. All right, hang on to your hat. You ready? The word justify may at times have the sense not to be justified, but to vindicate someone or some a a a characteristic of a person. If we say we, are believing, uh, we believe in giving to the poor, the only way we can vindicate or demonstrate our belief is to put our words into action and feed the poor. By doing this, we justify, or better stated, we vindicate or we prove our belief. And that's a legitimate definition 
to the word justified, it's the same Greek word, same Greek word, but it's not the major definition of the New Testament, but it's there. The definition of just, justify in this sense. That's why I would not translate it justify in James. I, I, I will now translate this as vindicate, which means to prove, to demonstrate. What am I saying? If you do a word study of the Greek word that we usually trust, uh, translate justify, you will find there are at least two definitions of it. Are you with me? One is what we always think about when Paul I, and the other one is right here for which now I believe James is using. That becomes a problem. So, here's how they set you up. I've had Roman Catholic, what you, what, what's your definition of de justification? And you go in this Pauline and you define it just justified, it's just, you know, as being declared right before God and you're just thinking you're doing a great job. And then he says, okay, place that definition in James chapter 2 and you're hung. Because now you're pitting Paul against James. You can't have one without the other. Correct. But right. But if you but if you but if you switch the definitions here, you're in trouble. So we'll look at those uh, uh, different views. Notice I got a Pauline one too in 1 Corinthians 4 4. That means vindicate, not justify. Yeah. Well, with the parent tripling that question, 1B3, uh, because it seems as though you're putting faith in works at the same level. <clears throat> you ask, is a man justified by the word or faith in both? That's not a parallel. Oh, yeah, I was just monkeying with you. Uh, I'm, just, yeah. I'm just monkeying with you. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we could say we're justified by works, but we can't use the same definition. Yeah, but what I'm trying to do now, Herb, is I could say that, but it would be very, what I'm about to say is going to be true. I can say I'm justified by faith in a Pauline definition, and I can say I'm justified by works in a James understanding. But if, I, if you don't know the distinction of it and you don't know those things, that's very confusing to people. James is speaking of a level below what Paul's I wouldn't say below, but just different. He's, he's talking about a different concept from a, using it. And I'm, I'm about to demonstrate the word justify. It's the same Greek word that Paul uses. Let's turn to, to Matthew 11, 19, and then I've got to let you go. We'll go back and... Lord willing, next week, uh, clean up some more of this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a, glutton, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax gatherers and sinners, Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. I, I, I translate it justified because it's the same word. What's your text say? It says vindicated, right? That's the same Greek word that Paul uses in Romans 4. Yeah. Because they didn't do a good job, in my opinion. <laughs> if I was translating the book of James, I wouldn't have put in vindicates. Now, if I did that, I'd have to have a footnote somewhere to demonstrate why I did it that way. But I just demonstrated from Matthew that the word, in other words, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the words that we could get for just this way, but I've just demonstrated by one verse that the word can mean that, 
then you would have to go to hand-to-hand combat in the text, which we will next week, of whether that should be translated in James that way. And I think it should. I've already demonstrated by this passage of Scripture that the word can mean that. The question is, does it mean that in James 2? And I believe it does. By the context. Let's look at, well, I don't have time. Next week we'll, we'll go 1 Corinthians 4.4 4 because that's Paul in. So Paul can use it both directions. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this passage which has caused so many people to be uh, confused. And um, some people uh, have completely misunderstood justification because of this very text. To the point that even Luther, Lord, as you well know, thought it was a contradiction with Pauline for so many years. Though I think at the end he came around. So Lord, help us to be men who are justified by faith alone, but not a faith that stands alone. That we demonstrate it vindicate that we have been justified by faith alone. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.